light, the radiant energy essential to vision. Lighting, the products we use to make light. Light Allure, lighting that makes a difference. For a hundred years, electric lighting has changed our lives. And for a hundred years, Light Allure, its people, products, and marketing initiatives have helped to build the lighting business. Born in the infant years of the industry, the young Light Allure quickly earns a reputation for quality. After World War II, the company brings modern design into home lighting, and it surges into the commercial market. During the last four remarkably fertile decades, Light Allure invents track lighting, develops high-performance fluorescent lighting, builds the downlighting market, and introduces digital dimming controls. From its early years, Light Allure promotes the magic of lighting. Its influential style books show distributors how to sell and customers how to use good lighting. But it didn't start that way. Think back to a time before electrical appliances did the hard work. Before cars ruled our roads, airplanes our skies, televisions our living rooms. Before computers, cell phones, and DVDs. It's the beginning of the 20th century. Homes and workplaces are dimly lighted by gas. Bernhard Blitzer, an Austrian immigrant, is working for New York City's gas utility, surveying houses for gas lighting. Sensing an opportunity, Blitzer forms the New York Gas Appliance Company with his brother-in-law. Bernhard's eldest son, Moses, 14, drops out of school to join the business. They open a store on the Bowery in Lower Manhattan. It's 1904. 25 years have passed since Thomas Edison demonstrated electric lighting, but the technology is weak and undeveloped. So the fledgling company sells both gas and electric fixtures. From the first, Bernhard Blitzer sets the company's standard for quality in all aspects of its business. I think the company's reputation for good dealing with people started with my grandfather who was well known in the Brooklyn community for taking a young man in and teaching him to be a businessman. The introduction of tungsten filaments in 1910 firmly establishes the dominance of electric lighting, which simplifies the company's business. Prospering, it moves uptown to larger quarters in 1915, and in 1919 changes its name to Light Allure, a combination of light and chandelier. Bernhard Blitzer dies in 1928, leaving Moses in charge of a dynamic, successful enterprise, one that he has already started down an aggressive path. I think anybody who spent any real amount of time at Lightly would know my father thought selling was the total center and most important part of any operation. And therefore, one had to learn to be a salesman. Moses' personal commitment to lighting has an inspiring effect on all those around him throughout his career and beyond. And he said to me, one of these days you find out if lighting gets into your blood, you'll be a success and you'll really like it. And lighting got into my blood. Light O'Lear advertises consistently. After sunset Light O'Lear and the charm of a light-conditioned room brand the company's identity in upscale publications. But Light O'Lear moves well beyond marketing slogans. Application of the product, of how best to use the product, goes way back in Light O'Lear's history, maybe even to the 20s. Later on in the 30s, we began to illustrate it, and the charm book was a series of renderings by artists of interiors showing how lighting added to the charm of a home. When somebody asks me what is in fact different between Lightlier and a number of other lighting companies, it really always boils down in my mind to the fact that we don't sell fixtures. 
we sell the effect of light. And that is a position that Lightly has been able to maintain throughout its history. During the formative decades before World War II, Lightolier builds its sales organization and a network of lighting distributors with whom it forges strong business and personal ties. To support its growing operations, the company moves across the Hudson River to Jersey City and opens showrooms in New York and Chicago. After the war, these expand to Los Angeles, Dallas, and Seattle. Following the Second World War, America enjoys a prolonged period of domestic prosperity. Light O'Lear, too, is in transition. Moses' children, first Edward, then Bill, join the company, and a group of talented designers follows in the 1950s. During the next 50 years, Light O'Lear builds the modern styling and architectural product lines that propel it to industry leadership. Fluorescent lighting, first commercialized in 1938, is the leading edge technology of the post-war years. Light O'Lear sees an opportunity. A new building was being added to Rockefeller Center, and that's how we got started on what eventually became the Optiplex fluorescent fixtures. Following Optiplex, Light O'Lear continues to innovate. Citron in 1952 is recognized by the Museum of Modern Art in New York for its clean lines and practical design. These advances, however, do not completely impress the architectural community, who still see Light O'Lear as more of a residential and decorative company. The Seagram's office building in New York City finally changes the company's image and puts it on the architectural map. The Seagram building was to have a large-scale luminous ceiling. And Noah Florence had this idea that we could stretch a vinyl plastic diffuser if we put it in a frame and allowed that diffuser to shrink on cooling. That was a fairly new idea. The luminous ceiling is luxurious but extremely costly in terms of energy usage. High-rise construction favors more economical spline and grid ceilings with lighting fixtures sized to fit standard ceiling modules. A decade after Seagram's, Light O'Lear pioneers the use of aluminum louvers to combine visual comfort with high efficiency. I was trying to make a one by four that was very efficient when I conceived the idea of putting one lamp over the other rather than side by side. And then we conceived of having a low brightness louver. Initially, these so-called deep cell parabolics are used by leading architects and designers for the most prestigious projects. As lower prices and architectural fashion drive the market, parabolics become the building standard for mainstream Class A offices. And the way parabolics were manufactured before we changed the whole thing was in many, many operations. Uh, we made it so that you could make a louver with progressive dyes, which means it dramatically reduced the selling price of the fixture. Light O'Lear introduces Calculite in 1952, although the first downlights are generally credited to Century Lighting. In the late 1950s, however, Light O'Lear opens up the downlighting business with Multigroove. Ed Cook of Century and my dad were friends, but not really competitors. And he said, uh, these architects that I'm working with have a new idea. I think we can't use it to any advantage, but I believe you could. And so we were introduced to what they called the pipe coupling, and that became known as a multi-groove, and it was a way of controlling the brightness at the aperture. Multi-groove sets a trend in recessed lighting, which is propelled by the simple lines and planes of modern architecture. Light O'Lear's Calculite downlights earn the respect of the architectural community which leads to more opportunities, such as the 1964 World's Fair. 
The biggest project was Quadrille, which was a either four or four and a half inch square extruded aluminum shape that we did actually for the Spanish Pavilion in Flushing Meadows. The techniques of downlighting are further developed by the growing profession of lighting design. To meet designers' needs, Lightolier expands Calculite and continues to innovate. Our system's different. We have the die case top. No matter how you put the cone in place, it's always the right position. Downlighting moves into homes. But cheap hi-hats erode Light O'Lear's residential business. So the company counters with a brand new concept, Lightcaster. Medium price downlights furnished in two parts, a frame-in kit and a reflector trim. It was a revolutionary fixture. Downlighting did not exist in this range of cost, but it was heads and over heels better than the competition. To meet its quality and volume objectives, Light O'Lear develops new production methods using hydroform presses and markets aggressively to capture the better residential market. First we had uh, meetings where we would bring 100 to 200 contractors with the distributor's help and we would go through the product. Uh, the ease of installation was the big thing for them. Lightcaster in a matter of probably six months was taking all the market share in the Northeast. Downlighting becomes the dominant lighting fashion in homes and Lightcaster evolves to meet changing construction and code requirements such as thermal insulation designed for energy conservation. The difficulty with uh, insulated ceilings is that the product must not exceed a specific temperature while it's buried in insulation. Yet you want to get maximum light output, still control glare, not have that lamp coming into the room side. And the way we did that was through thermal testing. With Lightning, introduced in 1997, Light O'Lear reinvents and repositions residential downlighting with contractors in mind. We lived it. We experienced it. We became the contractor. We took everything into account. Bringing in over 300 of our distributors and using all the style and professionalism that Light O'Lear has. From the 1980s on, Light O'Lear expands Calculite to handle energy efficient compact fluorescent sources. Calculite Evolution, introduced in 1999, brings new refinement to downlighting, now more than half a century old. I love the features, the uh, permanent vertical and horizontal locking, the degree of shielding that you get out of it. They're very finely architecturally styled. Even with its phenomenal growth, Light O'Lear is able to advance the quality of its downlights, which contributes to the company's continuing leadership. I think overall, as much as we incorporate technology in the reflector manufacturing process, there's still an art to it. There's an art to buffing. There's an art to knowing how much to buff. There's an art to anodizing, and I really believe that the people we have here are artists in that realm. Light O'Lear is perhaps best recognized for its innovative light span track lighting, first introduced in 1961. But light span does not begin as a system for accent and display lighting. Light span began with a pole, a pole lamp. It went from the floor to the ceiling. This was after the, the pole craze that had been started by one of our competitors. We responded by saying, well, we can make a pole lamp, but we can make one where you move the lights along the pole to wherever you want them. And one friend of mine, an architect, said, don't you know what you're looking at? This is not a lamp. This should be on the ceiling. Lightspan takes off changing the interior lighting landscape. Store lighting becomes more dramatic, museum lighting more flexible. Light O'Lear licenses Lightspan in Europe, where track lighting is eagerly embraced. Lightspan even becomes a home lighting fashion. Light O'Lear uses early low voltage light sources in Lightspan. In 1965, the company applies miniaturized technology to its light gem high-intensity lamp. It had a telescoping antenna, which no one had done at that time, uh, a way of making a very small lamp into a 
quite sizable lamp and uh, it was cute and it was recognized by the Museum of Modern Art. But it is the MR16 that ignites the trend to low voltage accent lighting. The concept was taken from the slide projector. Low voltage lighting made things come alive. In 1990, the new halogen PAR lamp offers another opportunity for design innovation. One of the challenges was that for me the scale was a big feature. And the scale had to do with bringing everything we had and wrapping around that lamp like a sock, right? Something that you wrap so tight. The oil embargo of 1973 ushers in an era of energy consciousness. As concerns about energy and the environment grow throughout the 1980s, Light O'Lear again innovates, this time creating energy smart track lighting using new compact fluorescent sources. The stores were major users of energy in fairly wasteful ways. So that led to a floodlight using a highly efficient source that mounts on a track. Clearly track lighting is a part of everybody's lives now. You can't walk into a mall, uh, shopping center, anywhere without seeing it. Throughout its history, Light O'Lear distinguishes itself by educating its sales force and customers about better lighting and how to sell it. The company seeks out lighting professionals and popularizes their knowledge. As we became more uh, sophisticated, it made sense to try to capture what these experts knew and publish it in a reasonably easy to understand format. The principle of selling better lighting grows into enhanced display concepts and lighting labs, leading ultimately to Light O'Lear's own tech center. And these principles guide the very selling methods used by Light O'Lear salespeople throughout the country. Kingsley did some magical things in terms of presenting the design, and, and I always found that Light O'Lear was very good about telling us how the product was developed, and why it was developed, and how it worked. I always felt like that I went in to educate my customers rather than to sell them, and they seemed to appreciate that. Moses Blitzer dies in 1967. Light O'Lear goes public two years later. Needing more capital to fuel its growth, the company issues a secondary stock offering in 1981, which leads to a hostile takeover bid. Light O'Lear then seeks out Barinco, a company with complementary lighting assets, and arranges a friendly acquisition. In 1984, Barinco bundles all of its lighting companies into Genlight, which it spins off to the public in 1988. Light O'Lear leaves New Jersey in 1995 and consolidates its headquarters in its largest facility in Fall River, Massachusetts. And uh, if we look back into history, I believe it turned out okay because uh, Light O'Lear became part of Genlight and uh, Genlight today is uh, one of the top three lighting companies in North America. Light O'Lear, first of all, is our uh, largest division uh, and I would view, and, and most anybody in our company I think would view Light O'Lear as our flagship company. The challenge we have at Light O'Lear is to get every consumer when they turn on the switch to really look at lighting in a different way. As I look forward, I see nothing but terrific opportunities for Light O'Lear. I also see the future filled with technological advances that at every turn will provide new opportunities for growth and new avenues for expressing what good lighting is going to be all about. Moses Blitzer best described the spirit of Light O'Lear when he said, do it first, do it better. Make a life while you make a living. Something must be right in order for our company to last as many years as, as our company has. One of the keys to Light O'Lear's success is new product introduction. Attention to innovation, the attention to products is our lifeblood, I think. There was always good product that was brought out uh, early and fresh. There's, I think there's a great frontier not only of uh, developing better quality 
better performance, uh, more sensitive lighting fixtures. This company is made up of lighting people. They live it, they breathe it, uh, it's part of them. It's the whole plant. We take pride in what we do. Every place I go, I, I go to a new mall, I, I'm always looking at the ceiling. See, well, I think we make those type of lights. We're making a life because we're, we're a family. I truly have made a life at Lightlier. This company gives us opportunity to, you know, work and learn a lot. Lightlier has been my life and uh, God willing will always be. Always new and it's always enriching. I think that's what it keeps you going. To enjoy what you're doing, I think that's making a life and do it with all your might. Company gave me so much. Give, give me the opportunity to grow and give me a lot of challenge for me to, to run with it. I guess very happy and proud to be a Lightly employee.